I think they, they know and they, ah, they, know. they understand when, when we start something. So dear all, good morning, and uh, welcome to our uh, final conference, Gender Equality Policies in Research Institutions Promoting Transformative and su Sustainable Challenges. My name is Vasiliki Munji, and I'm the project coordinator of the Equalness Project. Before I start, allow me to thank uh, the representative uh, from the European Commission, our guest speakers, our synergy partners, and of course all of you for recognizing our, our efforts with uh, your participation today here. Gender equality is an issue that concerns us all. It is a fundamental right. It holds the fifth place on the rack of 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations, with the sixth one to be the clean water and sanitation goal. The, important is the importance is apparent, and it is well perceived by the European citizens. According to a recent European Barometer survey, eight out of 10 people think that tackling inequality between men and women should be an EU priority, while nine out of 10 people agrees that tackling inequality between men and women is necessary to create a fairer society. However, gender equality still remains an unfinished business. We are far from reaching equality in many areas, and ict -IST is one of these areas. This, this sector is one of the most affected by the gender inequalities at all levels. In Europe, only three out of 100 women with a degree have a specialization in information and communication system, while men at the same time, the number is 10 out of 100. Our project, Gender Equality Plans for Information Soci Sciences and Technologies Research Institutions, began three years ago. We aim to introduce structural changes and enhance gender equality in research institutions. Our intercultural consortium from Greece, Italy, Germany, Finland, Lithuania, Portugal, and Ukraine brought in all expertise, knowledge, and tools necessary for the successful completion of the project. The project drawn on the European Union policy guidelines, as well as on the theoretical and empirical findings on gender equality in research organizations, targeting at ICT facilities and departments where gender imbal imbalance was especially acute. The project aim has been to influence organizational structures, discourses, and behaviors in order to foster permanent institution changes through the design and implementation of gender equality plans. Today, after three years of efforts, we are proud to state that we have done it. We have increased the numbers of RPOs in ICT implementing gender equality plans which promoted the gender equality in research at the department and in some cases at university level. We have contributed to the achievement of the European research era objectives. We increased in the long term the number of female researchers and consequently their research intensity. Today, you will have uh, the opportunity to find out all about our results, tools, to discuss opportunities, how to improve gender equality in human resource management and institutional communication, research design, teaching, and student services. We will also discuss how our results could be adapted and sustained. We will also focus on existing resistances, which are slowing structural changes, processed down starting from the perspective of the ICT institutions. Now, before I give the floor to my partner and friend, uh, Maria Sagiuliano, allow me please to say the biggest thank you to the Equalist Consortium members, to my colleagues, along with whom we have been working all these years in order to, define, to defend the fundamental right, in order to proceed to a structural and meaningful changes in our institutions, in order to be able to say that we were part of the force that led to the change. Thank you all for your efforts, for your commitment, and making this conference a gender equality festivity. I give the floor to Maria Sagiuliano. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky, for your uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Maria San Giuliano, and I'm, uh, I work as a senior research fellow at the University Ca Foscari in Venice, Department of uh, Computer Sciences. 
uh, and uh, our role um, as CAFOSCARI uh, was to uh, support uh, our partner RPOs into this uh, intensive process of triggering structural change in their own institutions. Uh, I have to say that uh, it has been quite an exciting uh, journey and I'm very pleased that today we have the opportunity to present our uh, results and our challenges as well. Um, well, basically, uh, we didn't reinvent the wheel with this project. We know that uh, gender equality plans are uh, widely uh, recognized as um, the umbrella policy tool uh, to uh, promote institutional and structural change in research uh, organizations and to achieve the uh, three era priorities on gender equality. Uh, we know that uh, they have been uh, supported from the European Commission uh, with both uh, FP7 and Horizon 2020 fundings, um, uh, around 130 probably projects have been funded so far, similar to uh, ours. Uh, I access to a, an AGE study back in 2016 where uh, uh, apart from the EU funded uh, projects many more were counted uh, who had gender equality plans in place uh, many more uh, research institutions were counted uh, more than 1000 1500 yeah so uh, as i said we didn't reinvent the wheel uh, but I have to say that what was uh, very interesting for, from our perspective uh, was that we started with one view uh, and one uh, perspective on, on institutional change and we uh, shifted it and changed it a bit along the way because we really started with a very inward uh, looking approach uh, and we kept it anyway. Uh, focused on um, building consensus internally uh, and using really uh, extensively uh, participatory methodologies, as you will uh, learn uh, from, from the uh, next presentations. But then, um, while, we, uh, while our partners started to implement, uh, we understood that um, um, RPOs were actually uh, using and adapting new strategies much more based on outward-looking efforts involving um, external innovation ecosystems where each uh, research organization is actually active and uh, already uh, promoting collaborations. So uh, we understood how um, leveraging on this, uh, <clears throat> let's say, quadruple helix approach of establishing collaborations uh, with uh, ICT cluster and companies, with uh, the national uh, ministries uh, on research, with uh, women's NGO uh, active in, the, in, the, in, in each uh, uh, context, uh, and many more stakeholders, high schools, for example, was uh, really a strong leverage also to create the internal engagement from the uh, uh, the, the management of the uh, universities because uh, gender uh, inequalities are actually embedded, strongly embedded into all the nodes which compose uh, the, um, uh, let's say, research and innovation ecosystems um, around, around uh, universities. Uh, so um, this was what we learned and it was uh, like um, uh, what we understood and uh, uh, as, as, as a good practice also from what our partners were, uh, were trying to, uh, to achieve. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we are also aware of the many challenges that we had to, to, to meet along the way. Uh, and the contradictory as aspects of uh, uh, promoting uh, gender equality in research at present. Uh, we had to face many resistances uh, and I would say that also in general there is not really a favorable uh, cultural climate, let's say, around gender equality issues at the moment. And this in a way uh, we had also to, to tackle these aspects. Uh, we know that um, there are implicit and explicit resistances. There, there might be indifference 
internally uh, and, and, and not only towards uh, gender equality uh, as a priority, but there, there is also this, the, the so-called fatigue, gender fatigue of those who are, who say that state that, uh, okay, we had enough with all these uh, gender equality uh, policies, uh, which might be perceived as top-down um, you know, requests from, from uh, the commission or multilateral organizations, but, uh, and therefore are resistant, resisted against. And there are also much more explicit, uh, you know, opinions uh, and policies around uh, fostering uh, the return back to uh, traditional uh, models of society where, uh, where women are uh, not actively engaged in, 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 the, in the labor force. So, um, nevertheless, uh, we, uh, I think, I believe that we uh, found uh, the right ways to uh, go through and to uh, respond to all these, uh, these challenges. Uh, and we, this is why also we uh, emphasized on the transformative uh, aspects of uh, structural change uh, policies in our uh, even in the title of our conference, because we would, we, what we tried to promote was really the idea that uh, implementing gender equality plans should, be, should go much further and much beyond, beyond a simple thick bo uh, thick, uh, box thicking exercise, sorry. So, uh, we just started. What we learned was that three years were not enough, honestly. It's just really a good start. Uh, and I hope that this conference will provide our partners with the energy and further thoughts and further uh, in expert insights from all our audience and speakers to continue what will be continued after the, the project will, will be closed. So uh, thanks again uh, for your participation. You know that we have a very complex agenda, so I will close it here. Um, uh, and uh, I would ask you to um, be as much uh, interactive as possible uh, with questions, answers, because this would be actually the added value of, of our event, interaction and dialogue. Um, you have been informed that, uh, that we are uh, recording the, um, the event, uh, and we are also on, on uh, live stream. Feel free to, uh, to tweet and share and use the hashtag uh, equalist2019. Uh, thanks again. So straight away, I will give the floor. Um, I will introduce the very first uh, panel uh, that I'm going also to uh, moderate, which is a setting the scene panel uh, where we will discuss uh, policy frameworks and uh, up-to-date insights from uh, our keynote speakers, uh, both from political sciences and uh, computer sciences, as our project was tailored towards ICT and ISD. I would give the floor to uh, Mina Stareva first, uh, who is head of sector responsible for gender equality uh, in DG research and innovation. And um, prior to this, she has also been working uh, on developing the European research area uh, uh, and also in, in uh, international cooperation in research innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to all. Um, I will speak like this. Um, let me just start by take, thanking you for inviting us. Um, I have, the title of my presentation is uh, called uh, Perspective and Challenges for Gender Equality Towards Horizon Europe. I would focus on the opportunities we have, uh, jungling between the challenges and the perspectives, of course. First of all, it's an opportunity for me. Uh, it's been almost a year I'm heading the sector of gender equality in the DG Research and Innovation, so I'm not at all at the level of gender fatigue, on the contrary. Uh, and this is the first final uh, project conference that I'm attending, so I really look forward um, towards learning more on the project experience, on the lessons learned, and on the recommendation on how do we actually ensure a sustainability of these gender equality plans and all the activities that have been 
as you rightly pointed, intensively um, promoted during the project. Um, but I will go to much more important opportunities for all of us, of course. Uh, setting the scene, uh, probably. I will, uh, I will change for you. Yeah? Okay, very good. Then this is a very brief slide, actually, not the next one. This is the content, uh, the second, the next one. A very brief, the next one, please. It's a very packed slide, as you can see. And you have already referred to that. Gender equality is a key EU key priority. It's enshrined in primary legislation, secondary legislation, European Commission strategies, council conclusions from member states, European Parliament resolutions, funding programs, and still we don't at all speak about gender equality. We are not yet there. So this is our challenge. What do we have next? Is the current policy context where we actually celebrate 20 years of EU action on gender equality in research and innovation, EU action meaning first communication on women in science 20 years ago, uh, EU action meaning first uh, mobilization of national representatives to support gender equality and to commit to gender equality in research at national level. Still, challenge, we are not yet there. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we actually support a Finnish uh, conference event under the Finnish presidency in the second half of this year to take stock uh, on what has been done, what has been achieved in the next year, in the, uh, in the past 20 years. I don't personally like at all to take stock, so I, we actually now call it take action. So basically we try to look to the future and to see how we can reshape, rethink, revise our objectives on the basis of the experiences that all of us had had until now. So projects, stakeholders, uh, policy-wise, and of course the Commission. And it's very timely also to take stock of these achievements because next year the European Research Area will be, as in our Commission jargon we say, revamped, reviewed, renewed, in order to have a more strengthened European Research Area to, to which member states and stakeholders are committed in a real way. Uh, which is the case, but much progress is still needed. And we really want to make gender equality remain a priority of the European Research Area. So meetings like today, recommendations of projects like yours, are, uh, let's say, uh, ambassador voices for uh, gender equality in the context of European Research Area if we manage to prove that the gender equality plans have been a leverage for action, uh, impactful act action. And of course, Another opportunity that we have is that our action is also, let's say, framed by the European Commission strategic engagement on gender equality, which will also be renewed with the next commission early this autumn or early next year to be confirmed. So this is on the policy side. And this nicely fits with, uh, uh, and this is my role of European official with a new parliament where, of course, the vote of the new parliament is a vote for research and innovation, and it's also a vote for gender equality, with a new commission coming, and with a new financial, uh, multi-annual financial framework program coming, and Horizon Europe. So I will go into details on Horizon Europe and how we actually currently can contribute to shaping gender equality activities in Horizon Europe. But let me just first very briefly recall, and that would be very easy because you both refer to that, the current context, one more please. Actually, gender equality, and, sorry, another one. We need to go to the full, full slide. Gender equality is one of their priorities. We act at, we have three priorities. You are all familiar with those priorities. We act at three different levels, and this is very important because we actually uh, support a systemic and coordinated approach. We work with member states um, in a very intensive uh, configuration where we actually encourage member states to set in place strategies to support gender equality, including gender equality plans uh, within funding and uh, research performing organizations. We work with stakeholders in commission jargon. This means research performing organizations, including universities, but also funders. And we also uh, address gender equality at our level. We have our own strategy with gender, for gender equality, and we have our own funding for gender equality, uh, employing a dual approach. Uh, gender equality is a cross-cutting issue, as they call it, I would say priority. Uh, and it's also, uh, we have also dedicated funding to gender equality policy actions. 
So having said that, you see, we have a good strategy and we have all the actors involved. Probably we are missing the business side, but this is to come. And despite of this, what we see, the next slide, please, the next one and the next one, is we actually, we recently published our um, um, report on the state of research and innovation in the European Union, the she figures, which we publish every three years. And uh, you can find the full set of publication on the website. And if you go to the next uh, slide, actually we can see that what the she figures 2018 edition show us is that we are at, um, let's say, at the level of overall improvement with a very low pace, actually, of, uh, of progress. So what we can see now is that women in Europe are, are, are outnumbering men in universities. More and more girls are going into STEM sciences, but still uh, in progress is extremely slow. Uh, girls and women remain significantly underrepresented and their potential is not fully recognized. This is a reality and especially in the field of ICT. And actually a few weeks ago at the CBU summit in Romania, EU leaders discussed the next European Commission strategic agenda, 2019-2024, sorry. And one of the key priorities to address was, of course, the, the, the needs for digital skills. And actually, 40% of the workforce needs digital upscale. Up so this is a reality, and we have a lot of work to do in this area. Um, if you go to the next slide, we will, you will see the, what you are all familiar with, the so-called scissors, which represents the journey of scientific career in all fields combined. So. Uh, uh, you can see that while you have uh, more or less gender balance at PhD level, the situation is, uh, the gap is increasing when we go up into the scientific uh, ladder. And then practically we have only one third of researchers, but you already said that, um, of, senior, of female senior researchers and only a quarter being uh, on top management positions. If you go to the next slide. We don't speak anymore about the scissor. So this is, the, this is in the area of STEM sciences, where actually the gap is much wider. And we need to think together on how to address those measures. Um, in terms of support, so what is the state of play? Uh, we actually um, promote the three policy ob objectives also within our funding program. A huge achievement with Horizon 2020 was to actually make uh, um, gender equality a legal uh, obligation. So it's an article within the framework pro program of Horizon 2020. And this helped a lot. And this helped a lot, a lot also internally when we communicate with our colleagues to explain why they need to integrate gender dimension, for instance, in research content. This helped us a lot. So we promote the same three objectives. And I will just spend a little bit more time on the third objective, which is not about participation in projects, which is not about decision making and gender balance, but which is about uh, the integration of gender dimension in research and innovation content. Uh, the next slide, please. Which practically means that uh, we take into consideration not only the biological characteristics between men and women, but also the cultural, the social behavior patterns of men and women, and the way research and innovation impact on the lives of both men and women. Um, and it took us a while that we actually promote this within Horizon 2020. Every year, uh, each work program has considered more and more gender flagged topics, meaning they, that they should explicitly integrate the gender dimension. But even today, with the 2020 drafts work programs, we are more or less at the level of 35, 40%. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a huge task. It takes time. It needs a lot of training. It needs a not, lot of communication. And also lots of, um, how to say, evidence to, to showcase why this is important. And this is why, uh, if you can move the next, the next slide. This is why we actually have set in place an expert group called Gendered Innovations okay, 2, which builds on the experience of the first, first expert group, and which, ahead of Horizon Europe, would look into some specific areas to provide, uh, first of all, case studies, case studies that speak why it is important <coughs> to integrate gender dimension and why, actually, if you don't integrate, your project may fail. Uh, and that would also elaborate a toolkit or methodology on how 
to integrate the gender dimension. The expert group builds around several areas, and one of them is focusing on machine learning, artificial intelligence, ICT. So the expert group has just launched, uh, started in, in March. But I think that out of this meeting, it will be also very important to see whether the project had at all considered the, the, this dimension of the integration of gender and research in the area of ICT, of course, and whether we can see some kind of complementarities between the work of the expert group and the outcomes of the project. Um, I will stop here on the project, but of course, on the expert group, but if you have uh, any questions afterwards, I'm happy to provide you more information. Setting the scene, of course, I cannot miss our specific work program, Science with and for Society, which actually provides f support for gender equality policy measures and which throughout, throughout the years has actually funded different gender equality plans. And I insist on the different because we actually, the evolution, the concept of gender equality plan has actually evolved from what colleagues tell me. Uh, from a debate and mutual exchange platform and experience into much more comprehensive and systematic uh, approaches towards uh, gender equality plans, where actually we put a lot of emphasis on sustainability, a lot of emphasis on the need to work with top management, the need to involve the top management, the need to work with the innovation ecosystems, as you have actually also referred, uh, the need to evolve uh, regional or national authorities so that you actually uh, spread the impact of the project and make sure that after the end of the project, three or four years later, the, the structure that you have set in place, the mechanism that are in place actually uh, continue. So this is why in the <coughs> topic that we have for 2020, that will be published end of this year, within the gender equality plans usual topic, we have put a lot of emphasis on the need to have national authorities involved in the project. In different ways are possible, of course, on the need to consider working with funders, considering their strategic uh, actually role in shaping the research priorities, on the need to learn from each other, to work in community of practice, and uh, so this, this for us is of course very important and I'm pretty sure that this is also coming uh, as, a lessons le as a lesson learned from the project experience. And we actually address two different topics. One is uh, a research and innovation action on um, sexual harassment, including gender-based violence in universities, uh, where there is an absolute need to uh, to, to actually to develop um, a more broader understanding on what are the actions to set in place to prevent, protect, and pursue such behavior. But also, we actually would really want to insist on the fact that every gender equality plan should also in address the issue of gender-based violence in academia. And uh, we are strongly aligned with member states on this, and we actually have just set an expert group, an ad hoc working group with member states working on sexual harassment at policy and strategy level, at national level and in European level. And then we also want to embrace better the innovation. The innovation, we want to actually, uh, innovation, but of course this is connected to ICT and uh, broader STEM sciences, we want actually to start as from early stage, connect and uh, work with young girls and boys to develop um, innovation culture, uh, gender equality innovation culture. So having said this, and this is the setting the scene, I would spend the last five slides on what is next, and this is the most, let's say, amazing one, because we have lots of scope to work together. Um, we have Horizon Europe which was actually the proposal of the commission was tabled last year. Amazingly fast negotiations with member states and European Parliament. Amazingly fast, good attention, I would say, from member states and European Parliament, but also from new stakeholders to uh, addressing better or making more visible gender equality in the Horizon Europe um, uh, legal base. Uh, we actually now have a um, political agreement on the, on the text of Horizon Europe as of March this year between the co-legislators, which allowed us to enter into the second phase of Horizon Europe, uh, call, uh, which is called the strategic planning process. So let me first show you the structure of Horizon Europe. We build on the Horizon 2020 very positive experience, so we keep the three pillars, focusing on excellent science, on innovative Europe, and of course, the bulk of it is the global challenges approach where we have six different clusters. 
And we also have a um, laying pillar, a horizontal pillar that, is, that will support policy measures to strengthen the European research area. So how is actually gender equality reflected into this, uh, um, you can stay on this slide actually, reflected into this structure? We kept gender equality as a legal article in Horizon Europe, which actually addressed the three objectives. But more, what is most important is that out of the negotiations with member states and with the European Parliament, there is an explicit reference to gender equality in two areas. One is the fact that gender equality needs to be addressed within the entire work program, meaning that every call for proposal should address or not gender equality. And then, uh, the, then an, another uh, explicit request from member states in the parliament was that when we actually develop the strategic planning process, meaning co-creating with stakeholders, with member states and with parliament, we consider gender equality as a compulsory issue within. So if you go, it will become more clear, let's say, on the next slide, not on this one, but on the next one. So what is the strategic planning process? It's actually... Um, it would allow us to develop a strategic plan that would lay down that would lay down the orientations, let's say the priority for the research and innovation agenda in Horizon Europe and the different work programs. And so of course uh, it addresses issues issues such as of course social sciences and humanities, gender equalities, ethics and integrity that needs to be looked as a cross cutting priorities across all the areas to be discussed in Horizon Europe. And we are here in this conference in a very timely moment because currently where do we stand? The Commission has worked with the member states on a very draft, first draft of the strategic plan. We are currently receiving comments from member states on this strategic plan, which will then be in one or two weeks period published on our website for public consultation with stakeholders. So that during the summer, stakeholders are invited to send us their input their reflection, how do they see, in our case, how do you see gender equality uh, activities under Horizon Europe um, supporting institutional change, but going beyond? How do you see, uh, the, I mean, the, how do you see the future of gender equality plans? How do you see the future of our activities, um, policy actions in support of gender equality? But also, please feel free to provide inputs also on the different parts of the strategic plan in the different clusters, uh, with link also to Inno Innovative Europe, with link to the different mission areas that the Horizon Europe have set. I think that this is very important. And all of this will culminate into, uh, the next slide please, into our first European Research and Innovation Days that will take place in Brussels on 24 to 26 of September. So, um, we expect uh, more than 2,000 participants. We have th three days events focusing on the, on the Horizon, 20, uh, Horizon Europe structure. Um, we will have our own session there, which is called uh, Think Gender, Think Different, and it will actually focus on the integration of gender dimension across Horizon Europe, where we actually aim to showcase some case studies of the expert group on gendered innovations. You can already pencil these dates for you. I think that it will be very important. But the most important actually is in between the, uh, the during the summer period that you really engage with uh, the commission on what you see as a priority to be addressed within Horizon Europe, not only within the separate funding provided for gender equality policy actions, which remain pretty much the same. I mean. The, let's say the structure remains pretty much the same, but the scope that we have is bigger. So your, I would say that your input on this are very welcome. And then because I put this slide, I also <laughs> tended to put the second one, which is my, the next one, which is my last one. Oops. No, Sorry. It's, it's the mission areas. A huge novelty of Horizon Europe, it's the way we work with uh, the scientific uh, society and with citizens, the way we work towards impactful solutions in five different areas. These are areas, these are not research topics, and what will be very important during the strategic planning process is to define the concrete areas out of those missions. But before that, the missions, for each mission we need to select a mission board. 
and the mission board will be composed, of course, of policymakers, leaders, scientific leaders in the, in the, in the one of those thematics, but also prominent personalities. We have an open call for expression of interest now, currently open, I think, until 9th or 11th of June, where we actually invite researchers interested and with experience in these areas to, uh, to, to apply for uh, becoming members of the mission boards. And my plea here is, of course, we have managed to have, uh, how in French we say noir sur blanc, but uh, we have managed to, to, to frame the mission board's governance by having a gender equality. This is absolutely not enough. We, we need gender expertise. So please, you have the link here. Go and check. And if you think that you have an interest to apply in one of those areas, then or otherwise promote it to your colleagues. So this is, uh, this is where I would stop. You will receive the presentations with many other slides so that you have uh, <laughs> called useful information so that you have access to the different documents and recent publications that we had, but also with our contacts. So in case you have any question or uh, post-conference uh, thinking or recommendation, please feel welcome. I really encourage every one of you to liaise with us and to give us your thoughts on how do you see actually um, the future of gender equality in Horizon Europe. We are, and this is true, uh, transparently open on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, a very uh, informative presentation and very interesting. Um, we will uh, come uh, pick up some, some uh, hints and questions in the, in the Q&A session and I would give the floor uh, straight to uh, our next keynote speaker who is Maxime Forrest. Uh, Maxime uh, is a senior lecturer and, uh, lecturer and researcher at Science Po from uh, Paris in France and he has uh, an extensive experience uh, in structural change uh, project, uh, projects. He, he was um, uh, coordinating the uh, EGIRA project, right? He uh, is now currently the principal evaluator under SUPERA, uh, and he is also uh, one of our uh, external evaluators uh, in Equal IST, therefore uh, our um, critical friend, friend, let's say, uh, together with uh, Lut Mergert. Uh, he's also an executive member of the French High Gender Equality Council. Once. So, oh, you, you were, okay. Uh, but I'm sure you are engaged in many more project, projects that I didn't mention. Uh, so, the, um, yeah, his presentation uh, is titled Transforming Institutions from the Inside Structural Change Towards Gender Equality in Research Performing Organizations. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Thank you uh, to the conveners for uh, for invi inviting me um, to 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 present. Um, maybe you are experiencing the same uh, in this context of uh, um, climate emergency. But any time I jump into a plane, especially when it's very early in the morning, I wonder. I ask myself, uh, what will make the travel worse? We'll see. Um, and. Uh, uh, what would make worthy to, uh, to uh, pour into the saturated atmosphere a couple of hundreds of uh, kilograms of CO2 more? Um, and that's, uh, if you, you don't think that way, I advise you to do it because uh, it kind of uh, um, encourages you to review your priorities. And uh, so I reviewed my priorities. That's why I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, because I changed my mind. And uh, I, I would like to deliver some sort of a political message. Um, and uh, to be able to deliver this political message and uh, to illustrate it uh, with the Equal ISC project, I don't think I will anticipate on what you will tell later in the day because I have a different perspective on it as an external evaluator uh, for Yellow Window and uh, I, um, I, uh, I expect to, uh, to, to point out things that maybe you will not point out so straightforwardly. Uh, but before to get to that point, uh, I, um, we need to, um, to, to try some sort of a, and an answer that would be complementary to uh, the two first presentation, actually, especially to, to yours, uh, which is where do we stand, actually, in dealing with uh, gender equality in research 
uh, and especially in STEM and in integrating gender perspective in research and innovation uh, content. And um, I do see three possible answer or a mix of the three. Uh, the one is that we are living, the first one is that we uh, may be living some sort of a momentum for gendering research and innovation. Um, the, and I will give a few evidences that complement uh, what has been said so far. Um, another one is that we may be living a backlash that will produce long-term effect on our capacity to deal with these issues despite the framework that we uh, are building. And the third one is uh, just maybe simply that we are moving far too slow, which take, it back, take us back to the climate change uh, comparison. Uh, or it is uh, the three at once, which is most probable as usually. Uh, so um, are we living a momentum for gendering research uh, in Europe? Uh, there are some evidences. Uh, some have been already provided, uh, strengthening uh, the framework at heel level for addressing those issues, learning from uh, uh, practice among each other at the level of each project uh, funded by the EU, or committed by the EU, um, at the level uh, of all structural changes project uh, through establishing communities uh, uh, of uh, practices. Um, and at a broader level, I would say like international level by uh, starting to confront uh, uh, experiences also uh, outside uh, uh, Europe, for instance, in uh, in uh, in Latin America. So we are uh, we are learning, and this learning process is also evidenced uh, by the um, growing quality of the EU calls themselves, because they kind of uh, shut a few doors uh, so that nobody can escape uh, 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 to address a few core priorities uh, to make gender equality plans more visible actually endorsed by the institution uh, uh, and sustainable. Uh, so uh, there, is, there is already a framework that uh, puts more emphasis on this aspect uh, uh, because this is learning from practice. We know that in the past uh, this was not necessarily the case because actually there were not enough guidance also provided to uh, partner organization to achieve this sustainability or this visibility or this uh, high level of accountability from uh, uh, top management. But that's clear. That's put, as you say, noir sur blanc into the call on paper. And um, <clears throat> it's difficult now to, um, to forget about it. Uh, but there are also other evidences. The figures that has been mentioned, I, I guess that we are far beyond that, that maybe uh, between uh, 1,500 and 2,000 research performing organization, let's say, are currently uh, implementing some sort of a gender equality agenda across the EU, but that might be a department, that might be a faculty, or a full university, or a small research uh, center. Uh, and it does not uh, provide any further evidence about the quality of those uh, strategy, about their uh, comprehensiveness, uh, about uh, their holistic uh, uh, dimension, uh, about their innovative uh, uh, mm, dimension as well. But there is uh, this, uh, uh, this evolution. And uh, of course, uh, we had noticed, and this is still very much valid, that uh, across the EU, the situation is not the same from one context to another. Uh, but there are a few contexts, there are a few uh, EU member states, uh, where there is definitely a virtuous cycle that has been put in motion uh, around the adoption of gender equality policies by universities and research performing organizations, and also by research a funding or organization. I won't call them not to, uh, to make too much publicity to them, although that they are too much satisfied from themselves, but there are a few. Um, we also uh, see that uh, we, uh, we broaden the scope, we broaden the family, uh, uh, involving, for instance, research funding organization. And we know that, as it has been said, that research funding organization do have the potential for setting new standards, just because they hold the money, and they can tell uh, what you should actually address. Um, they have this multiplying uh, 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 potential. Um, there are also um, quite new organizations in many countries, which makes them more open to change uh, and uh, uh, able to uh, contribute to setting a new uh, research, a new research agenda or new standard for uh, uh, funding. Uh, and we build. We 
do not only learn, we build. We build communities of practices. Uh, we uh, all together build new standards of gender equality plans because those implemented in a project like Equal ISD uh, are of a different nature of those that you uh, may have at a national level or even uh, if you are wanting to comply with the legislation, the domestic legislation. Uh, um, we uh, build uh, also new resources uh, the gender, um, the, G the gear uh, uh, tool uh, launched by EGE uh, a couple of years ago that is uh, uh, still rich and updated and uh, provide a lot of uh, resources to those who want actually uh, to put change in motion in their organization. Uh, gender Equality Academy is uh, also emerging to capitalize uh, on gender training capacities for uh, research performing and research funding organization so that we do not have to all look separately for the good trainers, the correct standard for training, but that uh, it can be identified easily, mobilized and delivered properly. Um, but there are also some elements of backlash and we have mentioned uh, uh, a few. Um, the resistances not only persist, they increased in some context, not everywhere to the same uh, uh, extent. Uh, there is a toxic debate that has been uh, built around gender issues in general uh, and that makes more complicated even than it used to be uh, to address those issues uh, in, uh, in uh, some context uh, because you need a lot of energy uh, to explain what it is about, to dismiss uh, fake news basically and uh, to uh, uh, actually uh, remobilize uh, people. And, but this has at least uh, a relatively, and there are some projects currently running, which I will not quote, who are facing through one or two partner organizations uh, these actual uh, uh, resistances, uh, which can be institutional or political. And uh, there are contexts where a rector can uh, um, like uh, jeopardize his own career just by pronouncing the word gender in the public arena. And that's in the European Union and he may have received you money to do it. So that should be a, a very clear warning for the EU Commission. Um, but at least it reminds us uh, that uh, what we are doing, it's politics. That's the political scientists who tell it. Uh, it's politics not in the sense that it is uh, so uh, as much ideological as uh, some re resistant people uh, may assume. No, it is political because what you have been doing in Equal IC over three years is negotiating, is identifying windows of opportunities, is pushing in one way or uh, adapting to the situation if the doors uh, were uh, remaining closed. Uh, it's uh, uh, mobilizing people, getting them engaged, maintain their high level of engagement, building networks within, outside, and outside your own organization, and I will give a few examples. Uh, so that's political, and that's what uh, you have been uh, doing. Or we just move too slow. Uh, we move too slow because of the resistances. Uh, we move too slow because we do not learn fast enough. <laughs> Maybe we do uh, 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 we uh, we do progress like only slowly uh, uh, because uh, we um, sometimes also fall in what I do call uh, the data trap. We need evidence-based policies, but I promise you, of all gender equality policies in all areas, are the most evidence-based policies. Just as climate change uh, uh, policies, they are built on a body of evidence that no other policy has, because most of policies are not built on evidence. They are answering something different. This is not the case of our policies. And still, we face the question that we, no, no more data is needed. And if we bring more data, then different data is needed. Because actually, the problem is not the data. The problem is what they show. Okay? So we should not maybe too much fall into this data trap, thinking that just bringing evidence will make, uh, uh, will make it. It's not where it's uh, uh, taking place. And we have also this gender fatigue that we have mentioned. For those we engage in this question for too long, because it's moved slowly. So it also uh, slowed down the pace, maybe, uh, because it needs, you, uh, it needs a lot of energy. That's the case also in... Uh, uh, organization uh, uh, which operate in a context which is rather favorable to gender equality for quite a long time to the point that maybe sometime you forget what you are uh, 
why you are doing that, why you are dealing with the issue. And this all together show that there is an increased need for learning, but for learning about what really matter, for learning about uh, what get us inspired, and for learning about what will speed up the pace and uh, allow us to uh, face those resistances. And this is where I come with a few examples that I would like to take from Equal IST, not, I think, spoiling uh, uh, the next uh, presentation. I think Equal IST, which has, I have been following as an external evaluator, especially from uh, the second uh, uh, iteration period, uh, has a strong learning potential for reasons which are common to all the projects of that sort. Um, the variety of, uh, uh, of uh, institutions, the diversity uh, of uh, context, the building of new uh, uh, useful tools that you will uh, reflect about uh, this afternoon, I think. Um, these are like things which are common to all projects and from which uh, there, there is also always something to take. Um, it, is, it has not a learning potential because it is perfect, because there are no perfect project. This one may have imperfection. For instance, the gender dimension in research content is a bit less addressed than uh, in a few others. The gender-based violence and harassment issues are not like core to the project as uh, they, uh, they might be. And yet, there are some idiosyncratic characteristics of that particular project which I think are uh, worth mentioning. Flexibility is dealing with circumstances. If taking the world consortium, uh, and to different extent for each partner, but there is this flexibility in dealing with circumstances. That means to adapt, not just to follow the past. This is a very well-structured project with a lot of internal reporting uh, and, uh, and uh, action has been implemented. But a part of that, of what has been planned, you have to adapt to what is possible to do during the project. And uh, 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 many of the organizations involved in this project manage uh, that. This gives you a, um, a capacity to identify windows of opportunity for change. Those windows of opportunities for change, they do not happen when you want or when you plan. They happen when they happen. And usually from external variables or from variables decided at another level. A um, couple of examples. In Italy or in IT and more uh, uh, universities, by law since the 1990s need to have a gender equality strategy. Everybody has, nobody is monitoring. I simplify a little bit. Uh, uh, and uh, no much happen, okay? <coughs> if I put it like that. This has to happen theoretically every, th every three years. So most probably in a three or four years project, it will happen. If as uh, the university in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Reggio Emilia and Modena, you uh, jump onto this, this possibility, uh, you try to get people elected in the unique committee of guarantee, which is the one impulsing gender equality opportunities, uh, equality opportunities agenda. Uh, you may have a chance to pull some of the well-soaked measures included in your project gender equality plan into the actual legally binding gender equality plan. And then suddenly it has a sense. Suddenly it makes sense to implement. Suddenly there are monitoring uh, 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 mechanisms. Suddenly there are people in charge. And suddenly there might be an impact and a model for the IT and plus other universities uh, across uh, Italy or you are in Lithuania and uh, it happened that the Ministry <coughs> of Research and Higher Education wants uh, um, uh, universities to adopt some sort of a mission statement on this aspect and that is following carefully your uh, involvement in the Equal IST project. Then there is a negotiation which is open. What do you put into this mission statement or whatever it is called? Uh, uh, how do you negotiate uh, some action to be implemented in the longer run and to be made uh, uh, sustainable? This can happen quite late in a project, but it happens and it creates a new chance for you uh, to, um, to, uh, to uh, operate. Or you may size, last example, you may size as a window of opportunity very early because it's possible and uh, you simply uh, try to have your job uh, um, included to a collective agreement negotiated within the organization with social partners because this is how uh, 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 the documents uh, ha acquire uh, um, strengths and a really policy background and, and support uh, into your institutions, that's the case for instance in Kharkiv, uh, and then uh, you had your plan not only endorsed but framed by something which is broader 
and uh, involve the usual power mechanism within the organization. These are a few examples of what you, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can do in terms of windows of opportunities. And uh, I would like also to add a couple of other uh, uh, important things for, uh, in terms of learning potential from that project. You mentioned, and you were right, that it's very important to now to involve beyond the organization to build network. For instance, if it's about ICTs like here, involve ICT companies, foundations, uh, involve a, a cyber society organization, uh, uh, involve a policy uh, stakeholder at regional, national level. This has been uh, uh, done uh, within this project to uh, quite a large extent. Uh, partners like uh, uh, University uh, Dominio in, uh, in Portugal uh, um, managed to involve uh, and uh, to, to let the project uh, uh, known to uh, national policy stakeholders, uh, also uh, increasing the potential for this project to, be, uh, uh, to serve as a model for the universities in the, in the country. Um, uh, again, in Ukraine, it has been uh, possible to involve uh, ICT uh, companies and to also to engage in national bodies where uh, gender equality policies are actually negotiated, as it has also been the case, uh, uh, as far as I remember, in, uh, in uh, Lithuania. So, uh, 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 and also in sp on specific issues at Unimo about like gender sensitive language, uh, for instance, about, yes, uh, document framing, the use of gender sensitive language in all uh, uh, Italy. And sometimes you need also start by building your network within the organization to make the project and the plan sustainable, that's for sure. This is especially the case when there was some gender fatigue, as it might have been the case in Finland, quite a progressive country on gender equality issues. Uh, and then you bring a fresh air to gender equality uh, 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 policies, and you need to first engage with gender equality bodies, which exist for a long time, to which you may have participated yourself, uh, but uh, which need some new insight, and a project like this is a source uh, of, uh, of uh, a new insight. Or like in VVU, uh, in uh, Münster, uh, when uh, progressively uh, what is a department-based project uh, broadened the scope of its activities, also engaging uh, with uh, the potential pool of researcher in ICTs, uh, as it has also been the case in other, uh, at other Partners. So engaging with secondary school education, engaging uh, with uh, uh, ICT uh, companies, engaging with uh, policy stakeholders, these are things which have uh, been uh, done quite to a big extent in this project. And last but not least, I would like also to mention innovation. We always pretend that our projects are innovative, just because we want to, be, to get funded first, and we need to be different from others. So we, we invent kind of concept of fora, of mechanism, of scope uh, that will distinguish uh, ourselves. Uh, but then we struggle a little bit sometimes, which is perfectly natural. We struggle to give them an, uh, the, the full potential, let's say, or an actual content and how they can help delivering. Um, <clears throat> what I appreciated and find really uh, powerful in this project is the connection that has been made between gender equality agenda and innovation in general. This is not something that you put on the top of your top priorities like internationalization, dealing with uh, uh, robotization, artificial intelligence, or, or whatever, since we are in ICTs. This is something that can actually contribute to that, or that can uh, bring also uh, new opportunities for exchanging in different formats. Uh, again, a few uh, examples. Uh, you got a new funded uh, fab lab uh, uh, doing 3D printing. You got a project also you funded on gender equality in research and uh, uh, higher education. Bring the two together, do something with that. Like uh, use uh, this context and this uh, tool as an opportunity for, uh, 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 for true innovation also in a practical uh, sense. Um, uh, create uh, 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 like a uh, uh, um, co-work, co-design workshop in which different people, students, stakeholders will get involved so that they can together uh, produce new solution, uh, use new uh, communication uh, material, uh, uh, crowdsourcing as you uh, did at the level of the consortium to find out 
potential uh, new solutions. So from that perspective, I think this project has been quite outstanding because it really engaged with uh, um, a lot of new practices and tick a lot of boxes, not all, <laughs> which is always worth men mentioning. Um, it was also uh, quite uh, well conceived and comprehensive, may maybe too much demanding sometimes. Uh, for reporting, but it did not. It did not prevent partners from actually understanding the windows of opportunity in their organization and to fully engage with them in a political way. Because this is actually what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Maxime, for your uh, uh, very inspiring and uh, even provocative thoughts under many respects. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Claude uh, Draude, um, and she will uh, bring us straight into what was really the most challenging um, aspect within uh, Equal IST, as it was already mentioned, uh, our gender equality plans uh, addressed the issue of uh, gender in ICT and IST research content only partially. This was uh, connected to the many resistances that all our RPOs had to face at the beginning, being pretty much new to any type of gender equality policies or concept, and so internally we really uh, had struggled initially, uh, and it was agreed that uh, gender in research content was not the best uh, first step to take in an environment which wouldn't really understand the meaning of what this, uh, of what implications this could uh, could have, but then we um, provided a, a lot of learning opportunities uh, throughout the project via our toolkit, via dedicated webinars, etc. And luckily, in the meantime, uh, a lot of new research was coming out, uh, and uh, we became aware of uh, the interesting researches, such as uh, the ones uh, uh, Claude Drode will present us to us. Um, Claude is a professor at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of Kassel, Germany. She's head of the department uh, and interdisciplinary, this is a key word, international work group, gender, diversity, University in Informatics uh, System, uh, GDIS, uh, and on the Director's Board of the Research Center for Information System Design. Uh, and she will uh, tell us about gender and diversity inclusive ICT research and design. Thank you, uh, Claude, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is actually the third objective which Mina mentioned. I'm gonna talk about gender dimension integration in actual research and design. But first, an accessibility note. So what I'm presenting here is obviously a PowerPoint talk with illustration and figures. Um, it's currently not subtitled. I think captions can be provided if it will be put on the website maybe. Um, we also have no sign language interpreters, obviously. Um, I will not use simple language, and I will talk in English. And I hope everybody can hear me all right. If you cannot, just raise your hand. Thank you. So actually, what are the problems that arise from not integrating the gender and diversity dimension in computing? So let me just start by saying that like 10 or 15 years ago, I always had to explain a lot why it actually matters, not just gender equality or have equality in teams, um, but how gender actually informs the building of ICT systems. Nowadays, the picture has changed a bit. So um, actually, hardly a week now goes by without news from press or social media channels that show us that computer systems are always not just computing systems, but socio-technical systems. They rely on social structuring, on classification systems, and they actually, um, sorry, let me just go back, and they actually um, relate to social inequalities in society. So this is an example uh, from a British uh, gym, actually, where a woman could not use her locker room because um, the computer system sorted uh, people with doctor titles as male. 
um, in computing what has been named as a problem is the so-called I methodology. And this is actually the link between gender equality and gender research. Um, I methodology in a nutshell uh, means that people who develop ICT systems tend to inscribe their own perspective, their own view into the systems if they don't have different methodology to do so. And this is, uh, again, something from media. A couple of years ago, uh, the Apple Watch was uh, questioned if it would work for people of color. It worked with a sensor, which measures your wrist. Uh, it, it actually is an electronic sensor, which measured, measures the difference uh, in light between the skin and the actual uh, blood flows. So in a nutshell, the, the lighter your skin is, the better it worked. And this has been linked to the people who actually develop it. So again, this was not intentional, intentional, of course, by the people who developed it, but it was an outcome, like an unconscious bias built into the system itself. Um, so today, with the rise of algorithmic systems, with the rise in, for example, machine learning and neural networks, um, those biases, and it's not just gender bias we're talking about, it's, uh, gender is always intersectional. So we're also talking about race, class, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, is built into the systems themselves. So what challenges do occur if you now actually want to put gender and diversity research and computing together, which is not an easy endeavor. A lot of times when I started out in this field, I got asked, but how do we actually do it? How, what do I do when I build a system? Um, I think mainly it is so challenging because we are talking about two different fields. And this is not just gender studies. This actually goes for all <coughs> social sciences and humanities if you want to bridge them to computing. Um, this is, of course, uh, a gross oversimplification, but you could say that, in a nutshell, gender studies as well as social sciences uh, are taught to analyze uh, intersectionality, of course, reflect on social inequalities, and that their main aim is, or their main uh, uh, working mode is that they intervene through critique and, of course, new knowledge, um, which is not as easily translatable to computing. So in computer science, as well as in engineering, um, we mainly build systems, not just system, we, systems. We also develop algorithms. We have theoretical models. But what is the difference to the social sciences and to the humanities is the nature and how you do research. Because after all, if you build a computational artifact, in the end, computers are computing machines. They compute. So you have to formalize your knowledge. It needs to be standardized. And this is kind of uh, a preach uh, in, 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 in nature between the two fields. So what we actually need if we want to integrate gender and computing, we have to have some kind of knowledge transfer between the fields. We have to create a third space. And this is where the so often claimed interdisciplinary work comes in. So what we need is a kind of knowledge transfer in terms, of, in terms and concepts. We need to develop methods and processes and also give examples and case studies. How can it actually be done? You cannot just sit um, somebody from the social sciences and somebody from computing in one room. I mean, this is a good start, but then they actually have to work together. It's hard work and it takes time. And of course, you have to educate both sides on um, how, this, how the other field works. So what I'm going to present in, in the last part of my short talk is um, a uh, process model that we developed. Um, it was an interdisciplinary project between actually gender studies researchers and computer scientists. And we thought, so we had the, the problem actually, we wa it was an interdisciplinary project and the computer scientists would always ask the gender studies people, but what does it actually mean when I build the system? Um, at what steps in my building process have to, do I have to consider what kind of factors? 
So um, what we did then was we kind of took the working modes in computer science very seriously and the knowledge base that we already had. So what you see here in the picture is um, what went into this, uh, uh, into this shape in the uh, upper left was that we reviewed, for example, uh, software engineering models in computing. There are a lot of standards and, and, and process models in computing. We uh, reviewed literature, how is actually research done in computing and how are systems designed and developed. And we combined this with a review on social sciences research and extracted from all the uh, extensive literature and case studies review what we call so-called core phases. And um, so the core phases are actually um, a, a describe a cycle on how research but also a development project, developing projects, uh, if you want to build a system, are done. Um, and I think they are rather easily sort of to understand when you work yourself in research. Um, so there was one phase though we added, and this is the first phase, the phase of impulse and motivation. Because when we, we also, as I said, we um, looked at literature and case studies, but we also talked about people. And what we found that what's often lacking in the, in the literature we reviewed is uh, where your interest actually comes from. Why is a certain topic tackled and others are not? And we wanted to highlight this and make it more visible in the actual research. Because this is very often the first step. Um, uh, in research, actually, like the fun, uh, invisible fundamental uh, basis. And then, it, as you can see in the cycle, it goes on. You have, a, have to define a project. You have to um, talk about um, how are you going to conduct the analysis. Then you go into a concept or a model development. Um, then you actually realize the project, uh, the, the, the model, you build something. This can also be a theoretical model. Again, um, in computing you also, for example, develop new algorithms, which you want to test later. Then comes an evaluation phase and, of course, the dissemination phase. I think this is probably familiar to people who work in research. So now comes in, how did we then combine this with gender studies knowledge? Um, again, we did an extensive gender and diversity knowledge review. We uh, looked at papers, case studies, we did interviews, and what we came up with was, we came up with ref so-called reflection aspects. So what you're seeing here now is that we're actually not talking so much about men and women anymore, but we use gender research as an academic research field with a certain academic uh, tradition, which mainly deals with social inequalities. Um, gender is one marker of this. Um, and this um, is mirrored in the reflection aspect. So you see, for example, we came up with <coughs> reflections on uh, the values that are implemented in systems, who benefits from the research and from the system that is built, to whom might it be relevant and to whom not? What is the work culture? Um, and what are the power relations in the field um, you're, you're working with? And then uh, in the next step, we actually combined this into our, what we call the GERD model, the Gender Extended Research and Development model. So what you see here now is again the cycle of the core phases in research and you now have embedded um, a social framing of those phases. So you now see the reflection aspects which are uh, more than the few I just said. So we um, encourage researchers to reflect in their research on the value question, on the question of knowledge, on the question of power relation, uh, language, human image and modeling, and on the relevance. Um, so this is just a very broad overview of the models. 
so if you go into the model, and I will show you a website later for the model, um, you can actually um, highlight, so if you are a researcher and are at a certain stage in your project phase, you can actually go into a certain phase and um, the model then gives you questions that relate to the reflection aspects to sort of guide you and highlight what could be important at this stage. And there, of course, the question of gender and other intersectionalities with gender do come in. So it's quite an extensive sort of research question catalog. Um, and since we found that the questions that you see here can be rather abstract if you have never worked with gender research or social sciences before, we also included examples in the model. So we wanted to educate people. So for example, if you want to build a system, um, we gave an example of invisible work. So we introduce what is invisible work. Um, some of you might know this. In, in a nutshell, uh, invisible work is often work, for example, infrastructural work, emotional work, um, work often done by women or uh, by people with a migrant background, for example. Um, and we provided some also references for it. And the picture you see here is actually one of my uh, former workplaces, which is a, a smart building. And when, uh, so we had a very super fancy set up smart building where everything was automated. For us as, as researchers, it was very convenient because we could um, alter all the room states, we could alter the lights and the, heat, the, and the heating and everything through a web interface. But what wasn't accounted for in the system was that there were actually people coming to clean, uh, which we never saw because they came at four in the morning to clean the offices. And in the, when the building was first built, um, they had to clean in the dark and in the cold because they only had emergency lighting and they weren't allowed due to their status as cleaners to actually access our highly fancy web interface. So this is a very sort of easily understandable classic example how you can leave out a whole user group by systems design and the system in the end will not work. So, um, so I'm stopping here now because I was supposed to uh, talk only 15 minutes um, and will close uh, my talk with a um, short summing up. So for me to tackle the current and future challenges of digitalization, broad topic, it's crucial to understand that gender equality and uh, gender research always have a relation in science and engineering. And I would totally um, second that it's important that we, we need more research on how to integrate the gender dimension into the actual system building. Um, and for that, we need to foster exchange between um, social equality research and computing much further than it has been done in the past. And we need to actually develop models and approaches. So we need to build gender equality into our systems because it affects our everyday life and affects social inequality or equality issues. Um, and my closing slide actually just gives a lot of links. <laughs> to, um, so I think um, they, the slides will be made available to you. I just want to highlight some of our research uh, projects that our group does. For example, we work on bias in algorithmic systems. We also have a project which is closely related to uh, Londa Schiebinger, to the Gender Innovations Project. We also have, are in contact with her. Okay. It's a smaller project um, called Innovation Through Gender in Computing, where we currently work with smart home technologies and the impact on gender equality, which is very interesting. Um, the website of the model, I must apologize, is currently in German only, but we are uh, translating uh, the website right now and it will be ready uh, by the end of this year. There's also an ACM article in English on the uh, GERD model and we are also planning uh, other modalities for the model to make a card set, to make an exercise kit, to work more with educators and students on it. So that was my talk. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much uh, to you, Claude, for uh, also a very, uh, an extremely interesting uh, presentation, um, which I would just comment briefly to uh, open up the uh, debate with our uh, audience. Um, it was very interesting to hear how you uh, stressed um, that um, uh, gender bias might occur uh, in ICT research design since the very initial steps of the motivations behind the identification of specific research questions. And then, of course, um, all the rest uh, in terms of how uh, users groups are represented and how uh, systems are built that might not acknowledge uh, uh, gender uh, differences and become uh, vehicles for uh, bias, further bias and discrimination. Uh, my question would be um, uh, to you, but also in general, also the other uh, speakers, um, having embedding a gender perspective into uh, ICT research uh, content design is really a matter of uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, being able, as you said, to build uh, cross-disciplinary uh, joint work between computer scientists and social scientists, gender experts, but how can we really achieve this uh, we, in, in academic environments where uh, interdisciplinary work is actually can, can even become an impediment to uh, scientific career progression? And this is, in a way, uh, um, a question which uh, is broader and uh, lead us to reflect on how much we really do manage to affect and impact on the core business of uh, scientific careers and uh, research, uh, the research environments where we promote gender equality measures. Um, I would just uh, invite uh, our attendants to, uh, to feel free to pose uh, further questions to our uh, speakers. Uh, we have a microphone that we can circulate, so just thank you. Thank you. I have a question to uh, Mina. Uh, you were mentioning the key enabling technologies of European Commission, which I remember doesn't include computer science. Am I right? Uh, this is a very good question that I really, I must say that I don't know the answer now. Uh, I need to check. Okay. And I can even come back to you during the coffee break. Uh, okay, thank you. But let's say that in Horizon Europe, we actually um, have a new way to look into missions, what I just said, but also into partnerships. And the partnership, we have three different types of partnerships. And one of the partnerships, of course, a huge focus is on digital and ICT and uh, computer science. Uh, so I don't know all the 17 partnerships by heart, but uh, I can uh, talk to you later on that. But indeed, we have institutional partnership, we have also organizational partnership, and a focus is, a huge focus is being set on digital, and there is one specific on uh, digital and computer science, but let's say that with the priority for the next strategic agenda being on uh, digital skills, you may be reassured that what we actually also promote uh, in Horizon Europe, it's actually, this also respond to your question, basically, is uh, the building blocks are interdisciplinarity, cross-cutting, the integration between the clusters and the disciplines, so that we have a really better impact on society and the social sciences and humanities are key there. Yeah, so, computer yeah. science, without mm -hmm. computer science, none of them is going to be possible anyway. So thank you very much. We have a question over there. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering actually uh, how in your project you encountered uh, the problems associated with the age divide in the research community as well. Because I think if we want uh, sustainable change and if we want to have more female researchers in those areas as well and attract in general more people to STEM. Uh, 
People in powerful positions will have to leave space and give space to new talents. Um, I actually happen to also live with a young researcher who's just starting her PhD, and there seems to be a, really a huge divide in uh, the understanding of the realities yeah, that uh, young researchers are nowadays facing. Um, the situation is increasingly precarious. It's not actually attractive to start a career in research. From an economic point of view, it's a, it's a very precarious living situation that you're signing up to for a long, long time. Um, I'm wondering how is this aspect accounted for in the planning um, in terms of uh, having a sustainable impact on the, on the gender balances as well? Uh, is, this, is there anything in order to open up those structures and uh, also work on the dialogue between the different generations in research? I guess I should answer <laughs> uh, to this. Um, well, uh, we um, actually um, the, the, we had a lot of uh, actions uh, in place actually to attract uh, female researchers uh, towards scientific careers uh, in the project. Uh, but your question uh, is, uh, and, and it was really, a these were really measures which uh, the uh, RPOs could uh, easily perceive as very useful because uh, an immediate uh, reflection was we need to uh, start from the initial sta stages where the pipeline is, is, is leaking. And so we, want, we need to attract more uh, girls uh, being enrolled into ICT, IST, but also to support their career development and career progression. But um, we have to say that uh, in, it's, it's, it's a matter of fact that uh, the biggest resistances uh, in the project were met from, uh, from uh, senior top managers, uh, often male top managers, not only, actually, but uh, this was, what it, was, it was a case. Uh, we didn't have um, the opportunity to, uh, to find, to have in the project uh, life cycle, uh, new uh, opened uh, position and new uh, recruitment uh, processes activated where we could really uh, have an impact. Uh, but we managed to, uh, at least um, in, in certain RPOs, uh, to make some changes into um, making the recruitment panels more aware of uh, gender, uh, un unconscious gender bias in the biases in the recruitment uh, processes. But of course, the issue, uh, issue of uh, precarious positions in, in research, uh, which are uh, really structural, deeply structural uh, problems, uh, we didn't manage to affect uh, this, this area, I'm afraid. <laughs> Please. Thank you, and this question is for Maxime. Thank you very much for banging out the realities and motivating us more to work more. Thank you. That's the reality, and we have to all accept it. I want you to give a little hint about different data. I couldn't imagine. <clears throat> I think it's kind of a misunderstanding. What I what I I consider the data trap is uh, not that we don't have to bring data or that we have to bring different data to uh, the stakeholder and the decision maker to, uh, to make them understand what it matter, why it matters to, to, to engage with gender equality issues and with the gender dimension in research, uh, but that we do not have to fool ourselves with the idea that bringing excellent, comprehensive, thorough data uh, will make them change their mind most likely. <laughs> it helps occasionally. Uh, but you need something different. 
And what you need different is not data, it's an incentive, it's a gain, that's why it's politics, it's a gain that you may take from engaging with gender equality. And, uh, and um, that can be very different according to stakeholders, but it can be, um, you need to understand what are the main concerns or uh, 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 challenges that they, um, they, they consider to, uh, as their top priority. And sometimes it can be um, the drop of uh, uh, talents, that they lose talents to another institutions, which is more granted with resources elsewhere in the country or outside. Uh, that uh, they are, um, they need to be re more recognized internationally. Uh, that they are uh, struggling uh, with um, op job opportunities for their students uh, on the job market. You can provide answers from a gender perspective to many of these challenges, and you need first to understand which one is it. And you can back up with data, but it's not uh, sufficient. And I take the opportunity also about your first question, Maria. Uh, how, how, how to uh, do interdisciplinarity when it's not valued. <clears throat> I think interdisciplinarity is, uh, is key, but indeed it's under constraint. Uh, uh, but it's not only about that. It can be also about uh, epistemology, uh, the history of science uh, that shows that we uh, invented our discipline, structure, organization at a time when there were no women on site, no diversity of any type, and that understandably is it has influenced our models, our uh, power structures, and so on. And, uh, and, and this recognizing this might be easier than getting into the flesh and bone of interdisciplinary thinking. Uh, and um, also the experience that we have from providing gender training in many uh, disciplines, across many disciplines, um, is that um, <coughs> you don't need to become a gender expert to understand that you need a gender perspective. Hopefully, <laughs> otherwise it would be a lost uh, battle. Uh, you need gender knowledge to be taken on board at some point to show you a few things, but then you can understand by yourself if you are accept to engage in this space of self-reflexivity because it often makes so much sense if you change your lens. And uh, you can see that also uh, in ICTs, and I remember recently in another project to run a, a workshop on gender uh, into integrating gender in curricula in civil engineering, uh, uh, um, nuclear uh, uh, engineering, um, maritime transport, and, uh, and there were half of men and women more or less into the room, and uh, they were coming from all those fields, and in a few hours they were capable of coming up with a gendered curricula and thinking because they just got it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were reviewing themselves uh, what they provide as references, which example, how they interact in the classroom, uh, what are the big challenge in terms of gender uh, in their disciplines because suddenly they were able to see. I'd actually like to contradict you on that a bit, yeah. which is always good for a discussion. Um, I think the problem with gender very often is, since everybody has a gender, people s very too quickly become experts on mm -hmm. men, women, and gender knowledge, and do not take the long-standing tradition of gender research, women's studies, and social sciences that deal with social inequalities as a valid field of academic knowledge, as expertise. Nobody ever would say, I'll just build a computer system because I've used a computer. You know, I think it, what you're describing is very, it's the important first step, but you also, you need gender experts. That does not mean that computer scientists themselves need to be gender experts, but they need to integrate other fields of knowledge. For example, if you uh, work with the elderly, you, um, you know, you talk to people about that. If we have so much domain, no domain knowledge, like for example, in medicine, we then work, of course, with people from the field of medicine. So if we talk about gender, there is the gender studies research body, and we should use that. But maybe it's not a contradiction that much. No, no because <laughs> okay. I think at first it's that the egg and the chicken, right? Sorry, yeah. is that yeah. you, you, you need to, that someone create a space of self-reflexivity mm -hmm. for you, which includes legitimizing gender knowledge, because otherwise you cannot engage possibly in self-reflexivity if you dismiss this mm -hmm. type of knowledge, so that's the first step. Then you have a space for in, in uh, interactions. Then you can 
exert that self-reflexivity with uh, some knowledge input and then you want to know more mm -hmm. and uh, you are able to recognize this expertise coming mm -hmm. from outside and to pursue it especially if you are encouraged to do it from above. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just to complement probably on this, just to put the practi practical dimension of how we would like ideally this to work, for instance, in evaluation panels, mm -hmm. of course we look for gender balance. Mm -hmm. Gender balance doesn't mean gender expertise. So then, uh, mm -hmm. first thing to do is we sensitivize the uh, members of the panel. And gender equality, okay, we project uh, videos, trainings about unconscious bias. But then we still consider that there is a need of gender, <coughs> of gender expert within the evaluation committee. And what we have seen in the past years is that those projects and that even evaluation remarks that were really focuses on gender equality are, we, are coming from panels where there was a gender expert and where we actually, the project applicants have received three recommendations on how to go ahead, how to set the project right, how to integrate the gender dimension, where it is really coming from a panel where we have a gender expert. So there is a need of complementarity of both, so that's, yeah. that's for sure. I, I, would, um, I would stress what Claude was, was saying, because I, I feel it's really sometimes also an epist epistemological, as you were mm -hmm. saying, Maxim, uh, issue. Mm -hmm meaning that there is a trend to oversimplify gender expertise and gender knowledge. And it is also about uh, you, the, 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 re the, the power in balances uh, between the, among the disciplines, you know, uh, from the, the STEM are perceived as the, the core of the scientific knowledge. Okay, this gender knowledge, in a nutshell, you have explained us what it's all about. We got it. We can, we can continue, we, we, we don't need further, uh, any further inputs. And so mm, it's true that then um, uh, everybody can easily feel they become uh, knowledgeable in, in a gender expertise which uh, on, it has on its background, uh, you know, years of uh, uh, work in gender studies and, uh, you know, uh, huge bibliographies and, and studies available, made available, and therefore I really think that the, the core element is uh, scientific collaboration and interdisciplinary uh, research teams um, working together to put the STEM disciplines and social sciences with a gender perspective uh, to, to, to achieve more reliable uh, research results and uh, more uh, useful also in the research results for the, and technologies for the society. Tino? Yeah. No, just a... Uh, <coughs> yeah, no? It's working? Yeah, uh, sorry. No, I, I think that it's very important what you said that uh, more than data, uh, it's important to have uh, uh, evidence of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the good practice and the, f and the positive effects in the sense that that uh, will uh, uh, give uh, much more motivation and strength to the action. Uh, I was wondering if we can really uh, uh, share some examples of uh, uh, actual benefit for uh, organizations uh, to adopt uh, um, gender or diversity uh, policies uh, um, in terms of uh, 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 impact which is visible outside uh, independently from uh, the uh, ethical or uh, philosophical uh, reasons, okay? So, uh, let me give you a simple example. Uh, I know that architects are not so gender um, keen, in the sense that, for instance, if you go to, to, a, to, a, to the toilet, to you know, a restaurant, you have always the same number of toilets for women and men, and you have always a queue in the women's side and nobody in the men's side, okay? Uh, a smartest way to organize a toilet would be to assign a uh, different space to one place to another, and uh, that would uh, provide an eff a positive effect. Okay? Uh, you may provide examples of the effectiveness of uh, 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 um, 
a policy uh, which is uh, which is. Uh, 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 I, I have the impression that on the um, uh, ICT organization side, uh, in general on the organization side, there is not, not yet a good uh, um, evidence of the positive uh, impact of, uh, uh, um, of the adoption of uh, 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 gender and the diversity uh, policies. Uh, uh, in terms of something which is, uh, uh, which makes advantage independently on the fact that uh, mm -hmm. it would uh, provide you a better environment, a better, uh, but something which is different, uh, difficult to, to, to measure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, uh, because I think that at the end of these uh, uh, different projects that we share, it would be very, very nice to, 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 to have a good experience that may be really understandable from outside. Um, actually, the thank you for your remark. Actually, the Gendered Innovations Project works a bit like that because they have case studies. They really have examples on how it ben how it's beneficial. Um, so, if you look at the website, you can see a couple of actual um, pro positive out outcomes. The most um, easily understandable is, for example, the pregnant crash test dummy. How you use a crash test car from uh, car body engineering, how you use a crash test dummy uh, with a pregnant belly um, in order to uh, protect the unborn child, of course. This is a very sort of accessible example I always find. Um, in my talk, I presented mostly negative examples. So I can come up with a lot of examples right now and each week in the paper you can read something that has gone wrong with technology uh, related not only to gender but also to social inequalities. But I totally second that, that we need positive examples, best practices. I'm sorry to add that yesterday we were at the conference of, like, the final conference of uh, a 40 uh, project. Uh, so yesterday there was a final conference of another EU-funded project called FRT, or I don't know exactly yeah. the stress, and they actually had as a handout, like, a, like, a list of benefits of gender equality supported by studies. I don't know if you had a look at it. Maria was there. So actually there is this material already summarized and prepared for us, but it seems like it lacks dissemination and it lacks that we are actually all aware about these benefits, about the success stories, about the studies which are being done. And here was also like, that's what uh, my question also, how to make it more visible because we have all these wonderful initiatives, all these wonderful EU-funded projects which have done this work, which have collected the positive examples, case studies, uh, literature reviews, and so on. It's all in place, but not many people are aware of them. And we also have this wonderful EU-funded projects, like we had a slide on variety of projects. And I think there's lots of output already and how to ensure that it actually reaches the target audience without giving information overload and that we disseminate it properly maybe. So I don't know if maybe in the, in the Horizon Europe you would have a project <laughs> about dissemination and thinking through the tactics how to make sure people are actually aware uh, of all the benefits which have been done in previous projects. <coughs> <laughs> I would encourage to have final remarks yeah. from our and speakers because we would need to wrap up and close. Yeah. I, I, I really think, you know, you first. Me. In any case, we are going to speak both, but... Uh, <laughs> Please, go ahead. Um, actually, uh, your intervention made me think that uh, I left the gear to in my useful links and then uh, luckily you actually presented it. But there, there are different issues here. So one thing is the gender innovations and the gender innovations too that actually showcase uh, positive, uh, so come with case studies on why the integration of gender innovation is important and how actually it relates to our everyday life and how when we, for instance, design transport systems uh, in an environment, we need to take care of all the aspects of uh, mothers taking home, uh, we, often women going to the supermarket and uh, taking care of uh, younger elderly uh, people needing some care. But this is the integration. This is the gender research. I think that your question was referring also of how do we actually actually take stake, stock of positive measures in, the, uh, in implementing a gender equality plan or in setting in place a, a concrete structure or strategy within a university or another type of organization. 
And um, this is ex precisely why in a few years ago, actually, we set together with the Institute for Gender Equality, uh, AGE, the GEAR 2, the Gender in uh, Academia, I think, and Research, Gender Equality in Academia and Research tool, with the purpose of providing an insight of best practices of what has been actually considered as a best practice and providing a very, let's say, structured guide on how do you set a gender equality plan. I'm very enthusiastic about the tool. The only issue with this tool is that it's not updated. It stops in 2016 and extremely good practices that happened since then in different universities across Europe, including in Eastern European countries, are not showcased. And this is our responsibility to update it because we, these are really key messages with which we can also convince top leaders, top managers to actually to be much more involved. Um, the weakness of this, of course, is that we don't have a coherent frame for evaluating these best practices. So how do we judge that something is a best practice? How do we judge on the positive impact? And actually, we don't have yet a view on the, let's say, the, the, the efficiencies throughout the years of all the projects that we have, we have funded. And this is an ongoing task. And ahead of the Finnish Presidency Conference on Gender Equality in Helsinki, we actually have set in place a small group that would analyze, that would actually, it is impossible to do in such a short frame to go with, with an in-depth analysis on the impact of the gender equality plans, but would take some sampling to do so, so that we really have a good conversation on institutional change and how do we really foster institutional change through gender equality plans. And another, last but not least, F40. The initial objective of F40 was to provide an evaluation framework for national measures on research. It, it looks like they, go, they actually get, uh, went beyond. Mm -hmm. So they have now an impact, possibly impactful tool for evaluating the impact of measures at also at institutional level. Mm -hmm. I understand that it's at the testing level. So we are very much looking forward to see how it really works in practice and see how we actually we can promote that. I don't think that there is a need for a project to follow up on something that is already available. Here the idea would be to see how we actually make sure that national authorities, uh, organizations, uh, funders, they can all have benefit of the tool that have been developed. So it's great that you have been attending this conference and that you're spreading the message. This is exactly what we look for. Thanks. And just a quick note, because I think it's <clears throat> the, the question of the example, the good practices took us back to the earlier discussion, actually. And uh, although I do perfectly, uh, fully uh, uh, agree as a gender scholar about uh, the in-depth nature of the gender scholarship and knowledge, um, I think there are two options. Either we keep on a defensive approach, so we bring example of uh, an always new example of good practices when you add the gender perspective, look how good mm -hmm. it is. Uh, and uh, we keep defensive also in the sense that, look, we have a huge body of knowledge. You should have a look to it, definitely. And if you have a look, you should dig inside because it's serious and we should be more recognized, what we should. Uh, or we have an offensive approach. And we are confident that the body of knowledge we have is big enough to demonstrate in quite uh, a, a short way uh, to people uh, doing research in a number of fields that occasionally they completely miss the point of what they do themselves. And that you can demonstrate to them that they, are, they, 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 if they accept the space of safe reflexivity, which is mm. the biggest question, mm. uh, <clears throat> then you can demonstrate that, look, if in 15 minutes we could together agree about the fact that you did wrong on such a big challenge of your discipline, imagine the benefit you would have to think differently. And then there is work ahead. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I have just one quick, really quick <laughs> note. Um, uh, it's more of an op open question to me um, and maybe also addressed to, to Mina, so we should maybe discuss it in the, <laughs> in the coffee break. Um, actually, uh, I would, uh, to me, the question of gender equality ob obviously is super important, but I also want to stress this question of how to relate it to intersectionality mm -hmm. and diversity and how does the European Commission um, try to implement 
that because this is also a discussion I'm also having in, in Germany right now. We are preparing the third equal opportunity report of the German government and I'm part of the expert committee. Uh, the, the topic is digital economy and gender and we are also trying to factor in other factors like I said um, and the audience already mentioned like age, race, ethnicity, different abilities, how do they relate to the gender dimension? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shall I respond? <laughs> <laughs> we are extremely late, so mm -hmm. just maybe a quick hint. I know it's a huge topic, but... No, it's a huge topic, but um, I started with my second slide saying that it's time, it's about time to revise our objectives and to adapt them to the reality. And one of the issues that we try to address, of course, I spoke I mentioned innovation. The other issues that is the must is how to proceed with an intersectional approach and how not to deal gender equality in isolation, but how actually uh, make sure to, that we consider all the intersections with other vulnerable groups, other minorities, other inequalities. And, um, and this would be also one of the session topics in the Finnish presidency where we actually look very much to, uh, to see what is happening uh, in the different member states. So this is our, uh, let's say, the, the additional focus of attention of our, of our gender sectors, sector which is now, I can probably announce it because we are reorganized in the European Commission in our DG for Research and Innovation, and the gender sector will join a unit that is called uh, Democracy and European Valley, Values that would allow us precisely to deal with, uh, to, to actually to place the gender equality strategy within a broader context and to address the intersections mm -hmm. with inequalities. So. Good. Thank you very much uh, th to, to our speakers and uh, to our uh, participants for your uh, interventions and a very stimulating set of presentations and debate. We, have, we, ne we need to keep it short now with the coffee break. Vicky, what would you say? When should we start the next session? In 15 minutes is planned. Some air and... <laughs> <laughs> okay. In 15 minutes, uh, we, we will be back here for the... Thank next. you. Thank you.